intro. So welcome to The Real Build. I'm your host, Bill Ryman, your broker builder. And today I got a guest coming from West West Chester, Pennsylvania. She is the creator of the New Construction Marketing Academy, an online learning resource for new home sales professionals. She's a host of a top-rated new construction marketing podcast. She's a keynote speaker, a a real estate agent with the Gary Mercer Group with Keller Williams, She was the recipient of Rookie of the Year, MVP of Sales, and many other sales achievement awards. And most recently, she was recognized by the National Association of Home Builders with the One to Watch Award. That's a big award right there. In her free time, she loves to hang with her family, which includes her husband, her twin boys, and her two Huskies. And she loves to read, well, kind of likes to read. She says more audio books than anything. So, and she loves to travel. Anya Chrysanthem, welcome to The Real Build. How are you doing today? Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate you having me on the show. I'm so excited to be here. No, I appreciate you coming on. And like we were talking about prior to this, me and you have a lot in common as far as, you know, being involved in the construction industry and then you know, being in the real estate industry on resales and so on. So I'm, I'm looking forward to actually diving deeper into that with you. Yeah, absolutely. So. It's uh, crazy times that we live in now. Yeah. now so. <laughs> definitely some crazy times and we're definitely going to brush on that, of course. That's a big topic. But what I like to get started with is asking about your background. So let's talk about who is Anya Chrysanthem. Oh, boy. How much time do we have here? <laughs> you as much time as you want. No, so, no time restriction. I guess, uh, you know, my story, um, you know, I always say, so I, so I was born in Russia originally. And um, so my family moved to the United States when I was 13 years old um, because obviously USSR collapsed. My father's a scientist, so there was a period of time when literally, it actually reminds me of what we're going through right now right. Uh, during coronavirus, where we would go to the store and there'd be no food on the shelves at all. And this wasn't like a two-week period. This was a long period of time. And I remember we had to have coupons because you could only get so much bread per family. And toilet paper i totally get it because uh, honestly there was a period of time where newspapers what we used so growing up in russia you know that was definitely my reality but the reality was i didn't know anything different you know people ask me like how was it different to live during communism when you know things were so bad versus when things switched over and as a child i specifically remember that I started seeing commercials on TV, like in my mind, that was the switching point, you know, because during communism, there were no commercials on TV. So um, to make a long story short, my family migrated from Russia to to US uh, when I was 13 and we moved to central Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, I ended up going to Penn State. Uh, That's where my husband and I met each other. And um, right after college, I moved to um, Philadelphia suburbs where I worked in, for a huge financial company. Um, so I was with them for seven years and I traveled all across the United States. And what I did is I educated uh, people about um, how to save money for retirement. So how much you need to save, how to invest your money so that when you retire, you actually have a nice uh, nest egg saved up. Love, love, love my job, absolutely. And uh, really enjoyed seen the country. Um, in fact, I think I've traveled to 46 states. So there's still wow. a few states that I haven't been to, um, but really loved my time and was so grateful for my husband to let me, you know, to, to do that. Um, and then when we had our twin boys in 2011, um, obviously I had to make a change and uh, take a desk job. And so I was still selling, um, at that point I was selling um, financial products to financial advisors and a lot of it was over the phone because I couldn't travel anymore. So, and I just remember myself driving to work every single day and that was not my norm. You know, my norm was I go to the airport, 
I, you know, uh, deliver my presentations, I come back, I repack my bag, I do my laundry, do it all over again. So this whole like routine of nine to five, driving to work, sitting in traffic, and just realizing like, gosh, I have these two babies waiting for me at home and really not enjoying my life at that point. Um, yeah, not enjoying what I was doing. I realized very quickly that I was not meant for that cubicle role. And so I was complaining to a friend of mine about that. And uh, she worked for a builder and she said, hey, you know what? You'd be great in new home sales. And so that was right around 2013. And uh, that's when I decided to make a switch to new home sales because I figured, hey, you know, I'm going to be out of the cubicle situation in the model home. I am my own boss, more flexibility, more freedom. And so that's how I got into real estate sales. Um, and then I guess, let's see. So I worked for builders for a few years. And then as my boys were getting older, Bill, as you know, the, the sales role for builders is very demanding role as far as your schedule goes. Mm -hmm. You work the weekends. And so it worked really well for my family while we had a young family because we actually were able to cut back on daycare. Um, but as my boys started going to school, I realized that unless I'm going to make a change, I'm really not going to see them uh, because the weekends is when they're home and I'm working during that time. So um, last year I did make a switch to um, Keller Williams and decided to go on my own and really um, take, I guess, uh, take, a, take a hold of my own schedule. And uh, um, also with my podcast, as you mentioned, I do have a podcast. So about two years ago, I started my podcast and that's also been taking some time away from my selling. And um, I've been doing a lot more traveling with that, visiting different conferences, and really just trying to be involved in the industry, new home sales specifically, participating actively so that I can learn as much information about what's going on in the market, what I'm seeing with other builders, what I'm seeing as far as technology goes and delivering that content to my audience who are new home sales people. So that's kind of my passion now is to take what I know about new home sales because I was so successful in that and bring the new information, new knowledge and teach new home sales people now how to incorporate a lot of that technology into their day to day to help them sell more homes. So short, <laughs> long story <laughs> short here, here we are. No, and I, I love what you're doing too. Cause I listened to a few episodes of your podcast when I found out about you. And I mean, there's not many people doing, you know, the new home sales angle. They're all just doing real estate in general. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's kind of why I started this because there was a lot more people talking about how builders need to build rather than telling the customer what they need to look for, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you're doing it on a different angle rather than telling the realtor how to be a realtor. You're telling the new home sales person, which there's not as many of us as there is real estate agents, but still mm -hmm. there is a lot of us. There's a lot of us that work for big organizations like you did and need to know how to execute on a new home but i mean in general your story is pretty amazing it's coming from the ground up you know mm -hmm. you you literally having moving here from russia with your family and then starting you know a new life and it's it really is almost the american dream i mean and then executing <laughs> the way you did and keep climbing and keep climbing and i mean there's so much more to come you know, as a, of, of course, but it's amazing story too. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I, I, re, I am so thankful and grateful every single day that um, I do have these opportunities. And I always think about like what my life could be like um, if I was still in Russia and I still have my um, brother and um, some close friends who's still living in Russia. And things have definitely changed a lot, but I always wonder what my life could be like mm -hmm. if I was there and um, definitely makes me appreciate what I have. And especially during tough times like this makes me think like, wow, you know what? I've survived much worse conditions than this before. <laughs> and so I'm sure that uh, we'll pull through and come together as a country and um, make it out even stronger than before. Um, but yeah, you're right about um, the niche. So 
you know, one of the things I was doing, Bill, as you know, with new home sales, you do have pretty lengthy drives to these model homes sometimes, mm -hmm. builders up to an hour. And so on my drives, I was literally searching for a podcast for new home sales people and I couldn't find one, yeah. especially a couple of years ago, there was really nothing, you know, it was kind of still the podcasts were not as popular mm -hmm. as they are now. And so that's how I came up with an idea to start a podcast because there was nothing out there specifically for new home salespeople. No. Yeah. And it's in, it's like now talk, touching on now and what we're going through too. This is only going to you doing the podcasting and you doing the digital media like you are and the marketing the way you are is going to put you above the rest of the people too. Cause I mean, right now, majority of the country is not working. You know, a lot of the country's at home. So that's where the panic is setting in is all right, what am I going to do now? So if you already established an online presence, and you can work on your online presence and still work from home, mm -hmm. you know, that's what puts you a step ahead. And, and people have been preaching about having that online presence and stuff like that for a long time now, uh, especially certain um, influencers and so on. But it's, it's, it's such a huge thing. And I'm sure you, you're figuring that out too now that what's going on is going on you know, to be able to right. talk, me and you talk to each other and still not somewhat that you're networking with each other, but we're giving information and valuable information to our audience and our customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's priceless. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, especially going forward, mm -hmm. um, the reality of the situation is this may be our new norm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that as far as the super viruses go, there may be more and more mm -hmm. of that. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think due to a lot of, you know, our own doings, mm -hmm. uh, what we've done to our planet, and uh, that's just the reality of it. So I think it is important to take charge of your own destiny and to figure out like, okay, you know, um, can I create something on my own and how can I maybe, in, you know, start something where I could work from home? Because if that's going to be more and more frequent, then we have to stay at home on a lockdown. It sure is nice to be able to continue to work uninterrupted uh, or, you know, minimal interruption versus somebody who physically needs to be at their job to do their work. So mm -hmm. it's, for sure, I feel really fortunate. Yeah, it's it's definitely a shift. It's definitely a market shift too. But on top of it's definitely a shift to the norm of what people are going to have to do business wise too. Um, and and it was coming, you know, not that the whole this, but it just now this is really going to show, you know, what people need to do now in a new world and a new modern tech, technological world to still advance companies and so on. So. Absolutely. Um, I always talk about how builders are typically a little bit behind mm -hmm. uh, general real estate as far as technology goes and adoption of technology. So I think this is definitely going to show a lot of builders that, you know, you can't wait for technology. You can't wait to embrace the technology. You have mm -hmm. to embrace the tech. Like look at Lennar, you know, I don't know if you've been following around what they've been doing, but they've um, embraced technology. And so they were able to kind of adapt a lot of tech that they had in place and do a lot of work from home now. And uh, I think they were a little bit less maybe affected than somebody mm. who is not embraced it, you know, who has a really bad website, who doesn't have virtual tours. And now they're like, oh, shoot, you know, what do I do? Yeah, no, I highly agree. And like we just said, too, it's, it's an awakening for a lot of people. And, and me and you talked about it, too. I mean, we've all kind of connected with similar people that you know have been doing this too you know i i've had somebody on my podcast you've probably had somebody that i you know and we've all connected in ways because we're all, we're already are all doing it and yep. willing to do it too so that's the biggest part um as far as you you brushed on why you got into real estate so what was the reason you, you chose it over other industries you know you were in finance you could have went a different direction. I know your friend kind of pointed it out, but what was your main reason for getting in the real estate business? You know, honestly, at that time, I was just so unhappy with my day-to-day -day work. And um, 
I knew that um, I was made for more mm -hmm. um, than what I was doing. And I knew that I really enjoyed being in front of people. I knew that I was good at um, selling, but I just couldn't stand that environment of the cubicle situation. And I, I felt like I, I wasn't necessarily involved in love with uh, finance. Um, you know, I was in love with helping people, but not necessarily the industry itself. So I wasn't married to it to the point where I was like, okay, I need to stay in finance, even though, you know, I worked really hard to get all my licenses and certifications and everything. So that was a little sad when, you know, you, you see that laughs and it's like, oh no, you know, all that time put into it. But um, so I think uh, for me, it was just about keeping an open mind and seeing what's out there. And um, talking to a couple of people in the industry before I made the decision to switch, they seemed like they were really enjoying what they were doing. And to me, um, I think becoming a mother really that that hit home that I knew I wanted to enjoy whatever it is that I was going to do. So that was number one determining factor. And I felt like hey, it, it, it sounds like a really cool job. It sounds like a fun job. You get to make a lot of money. And so I was like, you know what? Let me give it a shot and see how it goes. And I think that is something, um, my, maybe my background as an immigrant too, that I'm willing to adapt. Um, mm -hmm. So I never say like, oh no, I'll never do that or I'll never do this because I think unless you're in that situation, you don't know how you're going to react and what you may or may not be able to do. And so I always think it's important to keep an open mind and um, yeah, you never know which, which direction the life, life's going <laughs> to mm -hmm. throw you. But the, the bottom line is you can still adjust and you can adapt and make the best of it. So I think that was really um, kind of talking to my friend and talking to several people in the industry and seeing how much they were enjoying it and uh, seeing the opportunities that I could make for myself. And I figured, Hey, let's give it a shot. What do I have to lose? Yeah. I mean, and you, and I've said this, I've had a few people on my show that have kind of transitioned from different companies into other comp or, or different businesses and careers and other careers. But the main factor too, is you going from finance into the real estate industry and new construction industry. I mean, that's knowledge that a lot of people don't have. And that's right. going to just skyrocket you even further in this business because having a financial background is huge. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of real estate agents, I mean, majority of real estate agents, I shouldn't even say not a lot, majority don't have that knowledge. They rely on somebody else. So that's what was so big for you too. And I'm sure Absolutely. it's helped you. I think uh, it, it definitely gave me a big advantage to be able to speak to people in the mm -hmm. way that I understood their finances when it came to pre-qualifications and things like that before they even had to speak with the loan officer. We could sit down and I could figure out really quickly if, if they a, could qualify to buy a house and B, if they didn't have any money to put down as a down payment, I could troubleshoot with them looking at things like 401k retirement plans, like how could other assets be used and actually give them legitimate information and not just, you know, talk mm -hmm. to talk. So uh, I think they really felt like that I was an expert and that certainly gave me a lot of credibility. Yeah, which is awesome. So I mean, going on, the, I've, I've had a lot of real estate agents on my show, and you're different. It, and the reason because is, is me and you have a lot of similarities, you have expertise in new construction, that's where you started, that's where you mm -hmm. learned. And I always say that's, that's a huge thing, because not a lot of agents know how homes are built, they don't know what's going on they kind of just walk in and say isn't the furniture nice you know it's just they don't <laughs> they don't know how the trim was put up or how how the block here down here we use block you're more stick built but how things how things are assembled in a home which mm -hmm. goes a long long way so what was i mean you know what are some things people need to look for let's say let's go on as what are some things a customer should be looking for because i know how you got in new construction and everything mm -hmm. but how how does your knowledge of new construction help you with your sales and then we'll go into the next thing as far as what customers should look for in new construction let's start there 
Okay. So I think the way that my knowledge helps me with sales is I don't want to be everything to everyone, right? Let's mm -hmm. face it. There's a lot of different real estate agents and they're, um, I think it's great to specialize in something because again, um, it's such a diverse industry mm -hmm. and you know, maybe there's somebody who is great at selling really old historic homes that I know nothing about, you know, historical preservation, the rules, this or that. So I'm not going to position myself as an expert in that, but I do know new construction. Mm -hmm. So I think that separates me from the rest of the agents where I can definitely position myself as an expert in something specific. Um, so uh, as a lot of people are looking for new construction, I can really guide them to make sure that they're making right decisions when choosing a new home. And I think that's a big advantage because you don't want to be everything to everyone. You know, when you're everything to everyone, you're really, you know, you're, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're, you're not an expert, right? So, yeah, yeah. um, so I think that it is very important uh, for real estate agents to position themselves as an expert pick a niche doesn't mean that you're not necessarily going to be an expert in other areas, but as far as attracting your ideal client and your ideal customer, um, it is important that you establish yourself as an expert in something. Yeah. So construction yeah. just happens to be mine. Yeah, no. And I agree with you because a lot of agents, when they first get into the real estate business, they're kind of, I mean, they're lost. They don't know what to do. They don't know what and they don't really think of what they s should specialize in. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of just try and hit all directions, everything. And then they obviously listen to podcasts or watch shows on what they should do and stuff like that. But the thing is, you know, how you stand out above everybody else. And that's the way I've kind of marketed myself, too, because a lot of people like that I have a construction background. I was mm -hmm. born, I was basically born into the business. And that's how I brand myself, too, as your broker builder. Mm -hmm. You know, just because having that background has really helped me sell a lot of the houses I have on top of helped buyers find a house that's worth, you know, that has quality for the price and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and has things that it should be and it isn't overpriced because it doesn't have this. Or if they were needed to remodel it, I can tell them that, all right, you're going to spend this much on a remodel when you can just build new you know, what are you doing here? That's not right. good for your own investment. So it goes a long way. I mean, that's, and I give you credit to a lot of credit too, because I'm sure it's helped you as far as your resales and stuff like that as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yes. So what about, you know, what are some things, so if there people are buying or building a new home that mm -hmm. they should be looking for a brand new home, I should say. So I would definitely recommend that they don't forgo the agent. I think it's important to have representation on your side. Um, you have to remember that when you are walking into that builder's model home, that person, the salesperson is there to represent the builder. That's the bottom line, you know, so they're going to have the builder's interest first um, as much as they're going to be wanting to sell you a house and put your interests. Um, but you know, you, you just have to remember who's paying their bills, right? So that's going to be the builder. So I think number one, you have to have representation. And then the second thing with representation, you don't want to just pick a random agent. You definitely want to make sure that you're picking somebody who is really familiar with new construction, because like you mentioned earlier, Bill, there's a lot of agents, I'd say most of the agents are really not familiar with new construction. They don't know how the process works and they're going to probably steer you maybe not in the wrong direction, but as far as bringing value to new construction, they may not be uh, bringing the value that you actually need. So I'd say that's my number one thing is uh, make sure you do have representation and that they, they know what they're doing. So ideally it's somebody who um, had a few new construction deals in the past, or maybe even worked for the builder. Um, because I always say it gives me such a huge advantage that I know, you know, all their tricks basically. Right. So, so when I bring my customer to um, new construction to a builder, I know exactly how this works. And so I can really advise my customer and guide them through the process because let's face it, even from, signing that agreement of sale, 
um, it is very much one-sided typically, right? It's designed for the most part to protect the builder, not the consumer. So if you can walk through um, with your customer to show them, hey, you know, you really need to pay attention to this, this, and that, and can we make changes to that? And then as far as even selections go, you know, you want to make sure that they understand very well what's included in the home versus what's an option because most people walk into the model home and it's like, oh, wow, this is beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful, but you also have to make sure that, you know, you, pro you have to realize that you'll probably be spending about 10% of the purchase house on adding those upgrades. And, uh, you know, you want to pick the budget and you want to stick to that budget and think you, you really have to have a very clear understanding of what's included, what's not included. And when it comes to what's not included, what are my options? What can I and cannot do? Because a lot of builders will even put options in their model that are custom that they can't even offer you. So it's, you know, it's like, okay, why show it? Um, so I think you just have to go into it with somebody who knows what they're doing is the bottom line, because as a consumer, I don't expect you to know how to buy a house, how to buy a brand new house or how to build a home, because let's face it, most consumers don't do it very often and that's not their job. Mm -hmm. right they're not their job is not to be an expert so that's why it's important to hire an expert to have on your side no i highly 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 agree with everything you just said right there just because i mean it's especially with dealing with custom homes i mean we're a custom home builder and mm -hmm. the thing that drives me crazy is that if they are coming in and i'll get into price for the next thing that's a huge topic but if they are coming in with another agent or a real estate agent that they bought a empty piece of property with, and most of these agents send them to, let's say four different builders. Well, a lot of the agents don't know, you know, the differences between us. So I'll always ask their customers, well, who else are you talking to? And they'll tell me, and there's some big differences between, you know, us and another builder that's a lower end, more track home, more, mm -hmm. you know, builder grade material builder. And that's why we have such a price difference too. And I got to explain this to the customer. Oh, we didn't know you were that much. Well, we had a budget of this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time is not that I'm saying these people are a waste of time, but time is so valuable that if I'm out way outside their builder as a, or outside their budget as a custom builder, you know, these real estate agents need to do more research and get with the builders to see their price line and, and look at what we're doing too. Because I feel like a lot of them just don't know. They just kind of send them that way and want down here. I don't know about where you're at, but down here for if they send us a client, we got to, it's the going rate is 3% to the agent. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of just expect that 3% without really putting in uh, not all of them because i've had some agents i don't deal with that put in a lot of legwork but most of them just kind of you know expect it because they sent their your, their clients to you and then i got to be the one to have the sales pitch to the client you know so it's just it's it's very important what you said that people should a real estate agent should have the knowledge but people should actually get with an expert to help them too because mm -hmm. it's worth every penny because there's so much that goes into a home I agree with you. I mean, if you think about it, buying a home is probably single most important financial decision that you're going to make in your life. Mm -hmm. So of course you need to have an expert to represent you hundred percent. Yeah, definitely. So what about on, uh, let's say if they're b building a home, what are a few things that they should be looking for as far as on the building end? So if they're building a home um, and say it's a custom situation, I think it's important to be involved with the builder early on and mm -hmm. not get tangled up with architectural plans without getting the builder's input. I think that's a big mistake that people make. You know, they mm -hmm. come up with a plan and then they start the selection with the builder. Um, so I think you need to pick a builder first and then work with uh, to, to select the architectural plan along with the builder because the builder is going to again guide you and he's going to be able to um to give you that expert advice as to what works well what doesn't work well maybe you think this is a great idea but in reality 
it's really not going to be such a great idea to to put that in your home or even rearranging the home or you know um, I mean, that's what they do, right? <laughs> and day in and day out. Again, it goes back to working with an expert. So I think if you are determined to build a custom home, especially if it's on your lot, then you do need to pick a builder early on, earlier than later and start that process with them. And then I think it's just you have to be realistic as far as like what is your budget and that um, things are going to come up. Um, that chances are the time frame that your builder quoted you may extend beyond that time frame. So I think you have to have a really frank and honest conversation with your builder about the delivery times, like how often are they on time versus not. Mm -hmm. And you know, you do need to have a contingency plan for what happens if that house is not ready when you thought it was going to be ready. Because I have so many friends in my area who bought um, an older, like where I live, um, I'm in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Um, we don't have a whole lot of land available here. So it's a lot of the times you're buying uh, an older house and basically either tearing it completely or, you know, just redoing the whole house. And I think people have really underestimated just how much goes into that and what can go wrong in the process and how much extra time it could add to that process. And so I think you have to prepare yourself financially and um, you know, uh, mentally for the possibility of a delay. And it could mm -hmm. be a long delay. So I think number one is to have a frank conversation with your builder. Um, see, uh, you wanna talk to other customers who built with that builder. I think that's really important um, because the builder can also tell you, you know, pretty much whatever, whatever they want to say, but um, talking to customers <clears throat> is going to be something that you should do to get an idea for, have they actually been on time most of the time and are the customers happy afterwards? Because I think it, it, it says a lot about a builder. And then second thing, I think you just have to figure out, um, what's most important for you. You know, you only have such a budget, right? So is it going to be the structural options that you want to put into the house now? And maybe um, some of the cosmetic things like flooring, et cetera, you may want to leave that a little bit plainer and then change that over time, keeping in mind that a lot of structural options like third, you know, three car garage or, you know, two story family room or something like that, you, you may not be able to, add that on later, uh, at least not at a very cost effective price. So I think mm -hmm. you have to have a clear understanding for how much can I spend on this house, stick into that budget, and what are my priorities in terms of these options, because some things you can certainly do after the fact and probably a lot cheaper. And again, that's mm -hmm. where a real estate agent can help you figure that out as well as to, you know, what's going to give you the most bank for your buck when it comes to reselling that house because you may not be thinking about reselling now mm -hmm. but guess what coronavirus happened mm -hmm. something happens unexpected and you're forced to resell your house you want to be able to sell that and uh, recoup your investment mm -hmm. no yeah i love both of those too i mean especially number two because you know a lot of people going into it they don't they think about budget going into it, but then they don't understand that, okay, as a builder, we're going to set you certain budgets. And I have a lot of customers that abide by those budgets. And then I have ones that go outside of it. And I have ones that expect that they're going to go outside of it. Now, the mm -hmm. ones that do go outside of it, it's a lot, you know, I get, and it's not everybody, but I get those customers that everything's a complaint. Why am I paying this much for this? Why am I doing if you're building a custom house and you go outside of what that standard is, you're going to pay mm -hmm. extra. And a lot of people, it's so hard to get that through their heads, you know, because they think, well, I'm paying extra for everything. Why did I even build? Well, if you would have just stuck to the budgets, which you can, it's very, it's, you know, these budgets, I'm not giving you, and that's especially with us too. You know, we don't give minor budgets. We give actually good budgets that are mm -hmm. going to cover like appliances. For example, we do Thermador. So I give them a Thermador appliance budget that I know using another house we built in the past, it'll mm -hmm. cover. So if you're going with a giant wolf range over the typical Thermador cooktop, 
well, there's going to be a gap there, you know, and that's what, yep. the, that's what a lot of people don't understand. And you can be capable and the builder can, we can only hold your hand to a certain extent, but we can't stop you from getting what you want. You know, right. we can tell you you're going to be over budget, which we do. And the girl that works with us that takes the people for the selections and so on does mention that. But then once they get the bill later on, they're, they're not too happy about it. Not all of them, but you know, it's just what you said is so important. Just in a lot of it is ex, uh, setting the expectation up front. I've talked about this in the past, but you can't do that for everybody because a lot of people, no matter what, they're going to question it. So, <laughs> yeah. So I think it's just, you have to be honest with yourself as a consumer, yeah. um, you know, knowing that you're going to build a house, chances are it's going to be difficult to stick to the budget. Uh, mm -hmm. just because there's going to be so much temptation and so mm -hmm. many choices. And so you really have to make that decision. Is it worth it now? Or is that something I can do down the road? Mm -hmm. so. No, yeah, I highly agree. So let's, let's go on into pricing. So you've probably, you probably dealt with this in the new, new home sales and, you know, how can we convince people to, you know, buy or build with us, not based on price, but more on your your product or your, the relationship that they're going to have, how can we, mm -hmm. you know, push that because so many people, and I've asked this to past builders, I've asked this to real, I've asked this to everybody price. A lot of people are so price dependent, mm -hmm. you know, especially in times like now where they're seeing, you know, losses and so on in the stock. So how can we still convince people, you know, that we are a superior product and not just to look at numbers? Sure. So I think there's a big distinction between a price and a cost. Mm -hmm. So that's what a lot of customers don't understand going into it. They look at just the price up front. They see, okay, I have this brand new home um, that's priced maybe up to 20% or more uh, than a used house that I can buy down the street. And even though maybe the used house has been remodeled, uh, the bottom line is it still is a used home. So, uh, you know, just the easiest thing is to think about going to a car dealership and expecting to pay the same price for, you know, a brand new car mm. as, as a, you know, five-year-old car that maybe has been, you know, souped up with some cool stereo or something in it. It just doesn't work that way. So you have to realize that, uh, building codes are constantly changing and think about the materials that are available. Same thing with the car industry, like the car that you could buy five or 10 years ago, the safety, the features versus a car that's available today. I mean, we have cars that can drive themselves today. So same thing with the house, a house that you're going to buy today brand new home is going to be way more energy efficient than a used home. No matter how much you're going to put into that used home's insulation and try to do whatever else you're going to do, it, the bottom line, you're still going to have a huge difference there. So I think what you have to look at is what is the cost of living in this home over a period of time as opposed to what is the price of buying this home? And that's the bottom line. So assuming most consumers stay in their homes an average of you know seven to 10 years, I think that's how you have to look at it. You have to break it down into that time frame and saying, okay, if I'm going to stay in this house for the next 10 years, what is my cost for heating, cooling versus my brand new efficient home? What is my cost of updating that HVAC system versus no cost in a new home? What is my cost for replacing that roof versus no cost in the new home. So I think once you start to add up all those items, um, it certainly makes a lot of sense to buy a new home. Not to mention the time that you're going to spend on doing all these projects, the headache, you know, instead of enjoying those weekends with your family and actually living in your home instead of working on your home. You know, I think a lot of consumers are, uh, just not familiar enough with the true cost of what it actually costs to own an older home. And if you choose to buy an older home, that's fine, but you also have to be very honest with yourself as far as what kind of expenses can you anticipate and not anticipate 
with the purchase of that older home and know that, hey, there may be a time where you'll have to come up with you know, $30,000 out of pocket to replace those windows. Mm -hmm. And do you have $30,000 out of pocket or is it easier to finance that $30,000 in your new home because you're paying that over 30 year period and with today's interest rates, you know, it's easier to pay an additional $5 per month than to come up with 30 grand. So I think that's where um, a lot of consumers are not educated on what's the true cost. And um, I think a lot of them are really naive about what it would really cost to replace certain items and just how expensive it is to maintain an older home. That's, that's what it comes down to. I think that's probably one of the best answers I've gotten on that question, to be honest with you, because well, I mean, thank you. No, I, yeah. I did sell new homes. So. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, if you think about it, even with custom homes, for example, if, and, and I'm actually going to use this too in my, because if they're thinking about building with a, another builder, say they're l less expensive builder, well, mm -hmm. what's the cost versus the price on that? Is it mm -hmm. going to cost them their warranty if they have issues? Is, is it going to cost them that long-term relationship? Is it going to cost them, you know, going with cheaper products to get the price down? Are those products going to last as long on that brand exactly. new home? You know, so there's these factors that people don't really think about when they're shopping builders or bidding out custom builders. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're going for the cheaper number, well, I, I've always said I'm not your guy. We're not the most expensive. We're not the less expensive, but we deliver a superior product. We know it. We're very confident in our product, too. And we take care of people. You know, that's what it's all about. And, uh, you know, Bill, my um, good friend Quint Lear says that people don't want, um, you know, they don't, they don't want uh, quote unquote value. They, they don't, they don't want uh, a discounted price on the home or they don't want affordable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think about it, like if I say, oh, Bill, that's a really nice looking shirt. It looks so affordable. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that about uh, about their home, right? That their home looks affordable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a big mistake that um, people make and builders make um, when they try to compete on price. It's that whole, you know, Walmart discount. It's like, unless you're going to be the cheapest, then there's no sense on competing on um, price discount. So I think, yeah, it's, uh, you know, again, it, with you, it may not be for everyone, mm -hmm. right? You know that there's going to be a pop percentage of population that is going to be eliminated just based on the fact that you're a custom builder and the base, based on the fact that your price is going to be higher. But guess what? For somebody who wants the best available, that's going to be your customer. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I love that. I, I highly agree because I deal with that all the time too. But I'm going to use both of those things for now on because that's oh, good. so spot on. <laughs> That was awesome. So let's let's talk about the process a little bit. I want to dive deeper into that. It's important to guide customers, you know, throughout the building process or buying process. So let's let's explain, you know, so customers let's let's talk about the process of how you guide um your customers, you know, through everything. What's the best way? What do you go about doing just so and then talk about after the fact too how are you maintaining those customers and keeping that relationship a lot alive because no matter in whatever business and i like asking this question because it's so important you know it's you need to be doing it too so what are some things you've been doing absolutely so i think it's important to begin with i don't want to waste my time or my customers time so i'd like to do a sit down in the very beginning and get to the bottom of like why are you moving what's the bottom line for you? Like, what are the most important things? What are the deal breakers? And I try to kind of work out as much as possible up front and to figure out what objections I may come up against um, so that when I actually start to find, to look for that home for them, um, I've eliminated a lot of those obstacles already and I'm not wasting my time sending them something that's not going to work um, because of whatever reason. So I really try to dive deep and figure out what is it that's most important 
and what are the must haves and what are the things that people will be willing to sacrifice because i think again for a lot of customers in their minds they're looking for that unicorn <laughs> and mm-hmm. i always say there is no unicorn you're never going to find a unicorn there's no perfect house so you just have to realize that you're going to have to sacrifice on some things so i make them make a list especially if it's a married couple i always say come up with a list of 10 most important things for you and you want to rank it in order so For example, for me and my family, when we were moving last time, um, number one thing for us was to be in a great school district for our boys. We knew we didn't never wanted to pay for a private school and being in a good school district was number one for us. You know, number two for us was to be close to public transportation um, because we both um, know that it's important for us to, you know, once in a while to go out in the city or something. And we didn't want to necessarily, oh, back then Uber wasn't as readily available either. So that was important. Number three was, you know, walkability to downtown that we could go on our date nights or something like that. And, um, you know, number four was a big yard. Number five was to be in a specific area. And so we were willing to make certain sacrifices in order to get to that, knowing that the house may not be brand new construction or the house may not have everything on my wish list. But I knew that I could change that over time, but I couldn't change the location. Mm -hmm. So for us, that was the deciding point. And I always make my customers kind of come up with the same list and realize what is it that's most important because there are things that they can change down the road, but there are certain things they cannot. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important uh, to put that work up front. And then as far as the, um, the back end of it um, with the relationship maintenance. um, So with a lot of builders actually see that they make that mistake. Um, You know, I think most real estate agents are pretty good at, maintaining relationships over time because they know that it's going to be customer referrals. Um, You know, their customers are going to send somebody else to them, but with builders, I think they still kind of think more transactionally in a way, you know, so, um, and, and that's a big mistake. So I certainly think that you have to maintain those relationships and the way you maintain relationships is the same way you establish your relationships. And that's by, bringing value. Mm -hmm. So how can you bring value to your customers after the fact? And so think about some of the topics that may be interesting to them. You know, for example, with new construction in the first year, I don't know about you because you're in Florida, right? Mm -hmm. So it may be a little bit different, but in PA, for example, the big topic of conversation is appealing your taxes on new construction. So something that most consumers are not familiar with, they don't know about, and I can literally save them thousands of dollars just by bringing it up to their attention, letting them know. And so I'm always trying to uh, reach out to my customers, let's say at least once a month to discuss different topics. And of course, it's really difficult to do it one-on-one with every single person. So I do use a lot of video and um, video follow-up because I think video is uh, one of the quickest way to, you know, to build a relationship with somebody when they see you on video, it's much more personable. They're more likely to open it and watch it and uh, comprehend what that topic is all about. And if you're bringing value to them, they'll certainly appreciate that. Yeah, no, I agree. I've been doing a lot more video as far as email and everything to my past clients and current mm-hmm. clients too. I mean, because it's huge and they all compliment on it and say how great it is and so on. But I love the list too, because I mean, make, you know, like I said before, setting the expectation up front and learning what they want, all their wants and needs, and especially in real estate too. Not a lot of realtors do that. And I've spoke with past real estate agents on my show and, and they end up showing, you know, 15 houses versus the four they could have set on, mm-hmm. you know, and the people are seeing and they don't even remember the first five by the time everything's said and done. And one of them could have been perfect. So you're setting that list, really listening to the client, which is a problem with a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to listen. They just want to expect and they just want to, you know, kind of think that, all right, this is what this person's thinking right off the bat. You know, they assume more than 
they actually listen and that's a problem, you know, so actually listening to your customer, no matter what industry you're in is so important, even in building custom building, you know, if I'm bidding a job and, and I know for a fact they're bidding probably two, three other builders, then, you know, I'm going to ask more questions. I'm going to get more detail so I can get my bid more detailed than those other builders. Mm -hmm. And I'm usually the first one to have my bid in. Not that that's a good thing. I don't know, but you know, I'm usually the first one there to have it done because I already knew what that client is looking for. And I didn't have to call them with more questions and mm -hmm. drag things out and so on. So it's so important what you're talking about. Yep. Big that's guy. why God gave you two ears and yeah. one mouth, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> love that. Love that. So let's, the big issue right now, uh, let's discuss what's going on in today's world. Obviously, coronavirus is causing drastic changes to the market. I mean, you brushed on this a little bit. How can we still help clients with people stuck at home? What are some ways? Well, so I think that's definitely something we could not have ever predicted. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we're going to see big changes in, in our industry. Um, but I think one positive thing for real estate agents right now is that you do have a captive audience. Let's face it, mm -hmm. most of us are quarantined at home. So we're too busy sitting there either watching binging Netflix or we're <laughs> surfing the internet. I think my phone gave me, I don't know how many notifications that I'm over my, <laughs> my allotted <laughs> social true. media time because, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. So, um, so the bottom line is you do have a perfect opportunity right now to get in front of customers because you do have a captive audience. So the internet traffic has skyrocketed. Um, I know I've talked to some of my digital um, social media uh, companies and they said that uh, builder traffic on the builder websites up by last week, I was I want to say it was like 88%. And I'm sure it's even higher this week. Mm -hmm. So people are out looking. Um, you know, the bottom line is, uh, we were in a great market, great economy. Um, you know, this is not 2008, where um, housing market was not performing well. So people still want to move. So that's the great news. You have capt captive audience, internet traffic is up. And then another thing we have going on for us right now is that the ads, if you're doing paid advertising, the ad cost of ads is also going down because of big companies like travel and um, you know hotels and all those industries are scaling back drastically just because of what they're dealing with. You know, nobody wants to travel right now. So um, since they're not spending all that money on ads, the ads are becoming less expensive. So if you are going to utilize ads in your business, it's certainly a great time to a, get, get in front of the people and get those ads in for really much cheaper than they nor normally mm -hmm. are. And I think it's just a bottom line is to take the time to really reach out to your either clients, um, prospects, or potential clients, and how you're going to show up right now will really determine the way people perceive you in the future. You know, you don't want to be opportunistic in any way. I think right now everyone's going through a tough, tough time, and I think it's a mistake if you're going to convince somebody that it's a great time to buy a house right now because we just don't know that. That's the bottom line. We don't know that. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs. That's the reality of it. And uh, I think it's going to get a lot tougher before it gets better. Um, so I, you know, I can't say to somebody, you should buy a house right now because the interest rates are low. If in fact they're in danger of losing their job, it's just not something I would do. Um, but that, that being said, I think it's a great opportunity to have that captive audience and to, to do some education, you know, if you're doing first time home, um, home buyer seminars, this is a great time to do it online. So you can still do a lot of the stuff that you were doing just online. And again, mm -hmm. I think you and I are um, fortunate that we've been doing a lot of this um, digitally and we're a lot more comfortable with it than unfortunately most mm -hmm. real estate agents are, but it's not that difficult to learn if you, you know, if, if you wanna succeed again, it's, it's about time you adapt to new technology in a new way. 
So yeah, no, you have to, like we talked about earlier. I mean, you have, if out of every time now's the time to take the time to get past your fear of being behind the camera and just do it because the more you do it, as you know, and me and you talked about this too, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Uh, the more productive you're going to be at it and the more important you're going to see. I always tell people too, because there's a lot of people in this business that are afraid to do it. They're afraid just to go out and do it because they think they think everybody's in the background making fun of them or blah. blah. We have all had that fear, but right. in reality, you get more, you know, I, at least I did that where, you know, you get more positive and compliments than you do negatives too. Mm-hmm. You're going to get the negative comment here and there, but it's not directed towards you. Maybe it's directed towards something you're selling on, on a video or something, you know, but you're going to get that. And most of the time, if you don't have the confidence, you know, some people will see that too. And it, it's just, the more you do it, the more people are going to compliment you, the more that's going to drive you to do it more. And the more people are going to expect and want more, uh, media and stuff like that out of you too. And I'm, and I know you're probably in the same boat and it's just the more I've done, the more I continue to want to do. And Mm -hmm. it's like during these times, like you said, now's the great time to not pitch everybody and do the sales pitch. Cause I mean, I'm going through Instagram, I'm seeing ads on buy my program, buy my program. No, you don't want to do that. You want to teach people for free you know, offer them free advice and and just try and get in front of them as much as possible for free. And then down the road, when they're ready, they'll buy from you because you gain that trust. It's, it's, I mean, you're, you're, you're in sales too. That's what most, and when people are selling me, that's what I want. I don't want the hard sell, you know, nobody wants the hard sell. No. (laughs) And even, even us as salespeople, we don't like to be sold like that. You know, you walk in a furniture store and the first person that runs up to you and says, what are you buying? You know, you're just like, let me look real quick. And then, but then you'll get that other person that's like, Hey, I'm going to let you look. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm here to help you. You know, it's just like, it's, that's the difference right there. And there's so much things we can do now during this to help people rather than get money off of them, which a lot of them are hurt and, and hurting situations. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And Bill, as far as, far as like being comfortable on camera, yeah, the more you do it, the more yeah, yeah. comfortable you will become. And always yeah. remember people don't look to tear you down. Like, you know, think about when you're um, watching a public speaker, you know, mm-hmm. y- y- if, if they're struggling, like you feel bad, like, cause you want them to succeed. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to see people do well. And so people are not there to tear you down. And I think people are there to, to build you up. Of course, you're going to have a troll here and there, mm-hmm. but that's just, you know, that's the wonderful, just the, yeah, the wonderful thing about that is you got a block button nowadays. You block <laughs> yep, them. There you go. <laughs> exactly. So don't be afraid. It's just, uh, you know, you're not used to seeing yourself on video. It's the same thing when you listen to your own voicemail. It's like, oh gosh, <laughs> cringeworthy. But the more you do it, the better you'll be and the more comfortable you'll become. Yeah, it's like I, we talked about too. It was in my first podcast. I fear <laughs> even listening to that first episode, you know, because I'm probably going to cringe and hear a lot of ums, ahs, and monotone, and not as much questions asked at, to the to the interviewee. And it's just like I, you get better over time. It's so yep. much easier just if you do it and go out and do it and focus on just helping people rather than. Uh, wanting their money and wanting stuff from them. It's a whole big difference and it comes back to you big time. I'm a big believer in that too. I agree. So let's, let's talk about some of the things salespeople should be doing to not only gain more customers, but help their clients better. Uh, this is where you're, you specialize in. So I wanted to brush on this with you because obviously I got some salespeople listening to the show too. So you have said that you attribute your sales success to implementing systems that allow you to streamline, streamline and automate a lot of your daily activities. Mm-hmm. So your prospecting and follow up always gets done, which is so important in any sales industry. You've said that you believe that you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems, that mm-hmm. you're just one system away. Explain this in more detail. 
So I think we as human beings always have the best intentions. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of goes back to the new New Year's resolution that we all make. Like, I'm going to go to the gym every day. (laughs) I'm going to do this and that. And we start off um, totally intending to, to do just what we said. You know, our intentions are strong, we're determined, but then as the time goes on, just life happens and suddenly, you know, instead of going to the gym every single day, you go, you know, three days a week and then suddenly by mid-year, people stop going. So I think that um, it's just really, really difficult to be um, systematic and to commit to something 100%, especially when it comes to something like follow-up or prospecting. Because let's face it, for most salespeople, when they think follow-up, I think most salespeople cringe. Um, So I think as far as follow-up goes, most salespeople have a wrong um, attitude about it to begin with that makes them cringe. And that is they think that they're bothering their customers when they're following up with them. So I think that's a big mistake because if you put yourself in the shoes of your customers and if you think back to your last large purchase and how the salesperson treated you, like think about it, if they never asked you for sale, if they never followed up with you, um, you know, how does that make you feel? Does that make you feel like, oh, they're not taking me seriously. They don't think I'm a serious buyer. They probably think I can afford it. They probably think that, um, you know, I can qualify and it doesn't make you feel really good. It doesn't make you feel like they're taking you serious as they should. So I think that's a mistake. Number one, um, you have to have a right mindset when it comes to follow up. And it is that it's very important to follow up and that people want you to follow up, but you must follow up with information that's actually useful to your customer. So that's number one. Number two, I think no matter how dedicated you are to follow up, um, if we look at the numbers, we know that most sales take place between fifth and 12th follow up. It's about 80% of sales. And we also know that most salespeople don't follow up. So I had somebody on my podcast from a national um, secret shopper company. So they do video shop for new home sales people specifically. And they found out that less than 50% of people who were video shop followed up with their prospect. So that's an alarming statistic because we know that only 2% of all sales are actually made on that first interaction with your customer. So if most people are not even making that first touch up for to follow up, you know, even if you decide, okay, well, I see the statistics, this is crazy. Okay. I'm going to make a resolve and I will follow up with every customer 12 times. And if you do the math, it's just impossible. I mean, you know, unless you're going to spend something like 75% of your day on follow up, it's just not going to happen. So that's where I think it is crucial that you have systems in place just because no matter how good your intentions are, um, you can't maintain it long term. What's going to end up happening is you're going to burn out. Mm -hmm. So that's why you must have a system in place that will ideally automate a lot of that follow-up for you so that it gets done no matter what. And, and I think that's where, you know, sales is as much of um, art as it is a science. So the art part is, yeah, you have to be friendly, you have to be likable, you know, you Mm -hmm. have to know people and you have to ask the right questions and you have to understand customers. But the flip side of it is if you're not doing the, the day in day out grind, you know, you're, you're going to be out of the game and Mm -hmm. the day in day out grind is grinding and a lot of salespeople end up burning out. And so that's why I think you must automate and you must have systems in place for all those repetitive tasks that you're doing so that you can have joy when it comes to interacting with your customers and not 
get so stressed out and bogged down by all the other repetitive stuff. And, and so that's why I say that you don't rise to the level of your goals, but fall down to the level of your systems. Because no matter how ambitious you are, if you don't have that system in place, you will eventually burn out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just having that system or even having the routine too. Like I've, I've figured, because being in sales, as you know, too, it's so important to have a set routine to where all right, you're going to block out your days to I'm going to do this here, this here, this mm -hmm. here, because your days almost get ahead of you. And it's, it's such a big thing, especially in the industries that we're in you know, where somebody's calling and everybody, we're in a now world. We're in, I want this now. I want this now. You know, what are you doing now? And you as that salesperson, you feel like you have to accomplish it right now. You can't let that customer wait, even though you're technically making another customer wait because you're attending to another customer and it just goes up the chain. So then you lose yeah. sight on other ones and you for, end up forgetting about them. And I'm, I'm victim to that. I've fallen, that's happened to me quite a few times where I lost sight of a customer that I emailed back because I got hung up on another customer, especially being in two industries, building and doing real estate too. It's just, it happens more often than not. So I really have to structure everything. And if I don't, which I'm not really a person of structure, I'm kind of on the go and it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like being on the go. I like doing as I go. It's, it's just, it's a must in a sales world. And I highly agree with having a system in place and, and stuff too, which I'm getting better at. I need to get better at. Uh, I'll admit that, but yeah. Yeah. Great. It's like, I can't remember how many times, you know, my sales manager would be like, Oh, what happened to so-and-so? And, and yeah. it was like, Oh, that was like my hottest prospect a week ago or two weeks ago. And it's like, what did happen to them? Yeah. Then you go in your email and you're like, Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I never, you know, I never followed up beyond the mm -hmm. thank you for coming to the model home. So and that's yeah. the problem. Yeah. And it happens more to more people than we know. So great yep. thing. So you also said it's no longer sufficient just to be great at, at sales. You also need to become a master marketer you, and, and meet your customers where they are. So you can't just rely on your builder for your success, you need to make sure that you know how to attract your customers through marketing and create your own model of home traffic or your own model home traffic. So let's discuss some strategies here. Me and you kind of did. We brushed on. Let's brush on a few more. Sure. So I think the bottom line is the the role of a salesperson is evolving, and if you're not embracing technology, you're mm -hmm. going to become obsolete. So that's my point of view, and I think. Um, especially seen through what's happening with this coronavirus, I think it's certainly proving to be the case. The, the builders, the salespeople who've embraced technology and were prepared for this are not feeling um, as um, affected by the situation as somebody who, who has not embraced the technology. And that's the bottom line. So um, what I mean by not relying on your builder is that I do believe that you, know, you should be your own brand and that um, you know you have those customer relationships, and whether you're going to stay with this builder for the rest of your life, or you're going to go on to work for another builder, or on your own, or you know even if you switch industries, those relationships are going to be relationships that you should carry through with you. Because again, people already bought from you, they know and like and trust you. So it's a lot easier to get referrals from those people. And so it's essential that you stay on top of them. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of new home salespeople make is that they don't maintain those past relationships. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when it comes to embracing technology and social media, um, a lot of new home salespeople and realtors too make a mistake of, you know, kind of, dumping a lot of information, um, talking at you instead of talking with you. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of videos where, you know, new home salesperson is telling us about this great model home and their open house and that they're having this promotion or sale and nobody cares. Nobody cares until they care and, you know, the way you can make somebody care 
is take a different approach. And I think it comes back to bringing value to them. I think what you should concentrate on is establishing a relationship online with your potential prospects through educating them on the value of new construction. So if new construction is your jam or if you're in general real estate, you know, what is your ideal customer? Is it the first time home buyer? Then talk to the first time home buyer and educate them on, you know, what to expect during the home buying process. Don't just talk about that open house you have down the street. So I think mm. by spending that time and doing stuff that other realtors and new home salespeople are not doing because yeah, it's going to take a little bit more work on your part, but that's also going to set you apart from the rest of the competition because when people see you bringing value and they'll want to listen to you because guess what? Last time I, I watched your video, it was something educational and I learned something new. So I want to watch this video too. That's how they get to know you. And then suddenly they are interested in that open house you, you're doing because they like and trust you. Yeah. Yeah. And you're cause they, cause they learn, they know who you are mm -hmm. before they even meet you. And most, most people, that's how they're going to go with you no matter what. And that's this being, having the capability of social media kind of, you know, gets you past that introduction point. People learn who you are and then it kind of weans out people too. If they don't like you, they're not going to work with you. So you're that's not going to waste your own time. You know what I mean? And it's, it's just huge. Like, you, you know, and, and what you said, you know, everybody should establish their brand in some kind of way, but also like with real estate agents, I see a lot of agents getting into video more and more, mm -hmm. but they're doing it in such a boring way that how are you going to stand out from the rest of the people? Like with me, I like to do walkthroughs, but I talk, I, t I kind of educate as I'm walking through, but I make it funny. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I bring some comedy to it. I don't, do any special effects or anything i've seen some realtors go all out on that aspect but if you make it to where people you're going to keep their attention too and have some jokes where you know if i'm showing the master bath i'm sitting in the tub or you know it's stuff like that it's just be funny and be yourself and just don't be awkward obviously but uh, there's so many real estate agents I see that get into it. They're talking monotone and say, this is the kitchen. Look at the cabinets. Aren't they great? Right. Look at this big island here. Wow. On to the next room, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like even, um, I think I saw a video you did uh, on social the other day about staining the ceiling. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. And it looks so cool. So yeah. for me as a, as a consumer watching that, that was you know, I found myself watching it more longer yeah. than and I it's, expected and it's quick. to get because it's yeah. like, oh, that's a really cool looking ceiling. That's yeah. not something most people think about. And no, because yeah. most people don't know. And that's the thing. Like it's, and it, I do, it's quick too. So you keep everybody's yeah. attention and that's it. You get your point across, you teach them something and that I, I don't sell them anything at the end. That's it you know, and you move on. So it's establishing that, that brand and building the brand should be the key thing for everybody. When I first got into real estate, you know, and I wanted to start my own business, which that was a whole nother thing. Um, but I wanted to brand the business and I short, I quickly learned that you can't, you, it's not about branding your business. It's about branding you because people mm -hmm. buy you, they don't buy the business. Exactly. You know, and, and that's what a lot of people don't understand these days when they're, they're doing advertising for their business. It, it doesn't matter. People want to see you. They want to see a person. If they click on your website, they want to see a person, not a picture of a house. You know, they want to interact with who they're going to interact with. And it's just, it's a huge thing with branding. And I learned that real quick too, after a lot of money wasted. <laughs> I agree with you. And I think people tend to overthink the whole branding thing. I think, you know, when you think brand, just think about how you want people to think about you professionally when you're not in the same room with them. And that's all it is to it. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I highly agree. So I want to move forward. I want to talk about you personally. And I've been asking this question to everybody and I've gotten a different answer every time. I swear, I'm just going to take it and put it in one big <laughs> video reel because it's so amazing. Everybody, everybody's answer is always unbelievable. So what about you personally? What lessons have you learned throughout your journey that we should all apply to our own business or lives that can help us grow? 
Oh boy, let's see what I've learned. So I think for me, it again goes back to me being a um, being an immigrant, and is that the fact that I don't be afraid to pivot and don't be afraid to adapt to something different. Um, you know, be open minded because you never know. Uh, until you try. You may say, no, there's no way this is going to work for me, or there's no way that this I'm going to like this. You don't know until you try. And also, um, I think it's important to not be perfectionist. So I'm very lucky that I don't uh, suffer from the perfectionist gene. So I'm not afraid to try things. And even if it means failing or not, you know, putting the, the best looking thing out there, um, especially the world that we live in now, if you're going to go, especially if you're going to start a business or something, if you have an idea, I think it's important to put it out there as quickly as possible to get feedback from people rather than wait until you have it figured out perfectly because you can have a, a, a perfect failure. Mm -hmm. Love that. See, knocked it out of the park with that one too. See, I always get a good, I always get a good answer on that one. So here's another one I've been asking too. So most people ask about your past, not many people ask about your future. So you know, whether it's business or life, where will we see you in the future? Who will you be? Oh gosh. I think again, uh, it's so unpredictable what's going to happen <laughs> in the future. Um, you know, I, to be honest with you, I, up until probably a year ago or so, I couldn't even look past like a, you know, couple year plan. So now I think I'm more and more focused on, okay, I can have more of a clear five, 10 year vision and see myself. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly what I'm going to be doing. I know for a fact that I'm going to um, be a mother. You know, I'm, I'm expecting uh, my third child now. So I'm actually eight Congrats. months pregnant. So this is a, you know, certainly a crazy time to be pregnant and mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be a heck of a story to tell my daughter when she's born. Um, but I do know that... Uh, it's important for me to um, to make my own rules and that whatever I do, I want to um, build a life and business around how I want to live. I think life is too short and, um, you know, especially going through something like coronavirus, it makes you realize more and more like what's really important in this life. And for me, it's to be able to control my own schedule and to be able to do the things that I want to do, be, be with my family, even if it means giving up some financial gain in some way. I mean, hopefully not, <laughs> you know, hopefully um, I can figure out a way to, to be really successfully, successful financially. But I think first and foremost to me, it's to be able to do it on my own terms. And that's the bottom line. I don't want to awesome. be living on somebody else's terms. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. And I think this whole coronavirus thing too, believe it or not, I think, you know, though there's a lot of negatives with it, I've talked with other people. I think it's going to bring out a lot of positives with people and business and so on, you know, as far as maybe focus on cleanliness and families coming more together. Cause now mm -hmm. that you have to spend more time with your kids and I've said it with my sister and my niece and nephew and my brother and his, and my two nieces there that, you know, now they have to actually, it's not, their kids aren't all gone all day. Now they have to spend time with them, figure out stuff yeah. to do with them, you know, and it's just not, they're at school all day. They come home, you come home from work and you have to get, it's, I think it's going to bring more families together in a way might drive them a little more nuts in a lot of other yes. ways too, but it'll make yeah, you, I've uh, been make joking people. that, uh, you know, I, I'm so used to working from home that, uh, this whole coronavirus actually threw monkey rage the opposite direction because now I have my hubbies at home, my boys are yeah. at home and I got booted out of my office and now I'm like less productive than I ever <laughs> am working from home because everyone's just in my business yeah, and, yeah. you know, trying to deal with two um, <clears throat> second graders and trying to get their homework um, done and schoolwork done and everything else. It's um, certainly been challenged, but you know what? Yeah. I think we, as a, as people, uh, we've gone through much tougher 
times, like if you look historically, like we've lived in a pretty easy time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. People have dealt with some crazy stuff in the past. So I think that we're going to be just fine. We're yeah. certainly going to come out maybe a little bruised and battered, but I think better than ever before. I highly agree with that. Love that. And then my final question I ask this to everybody, what exactly do people need to look for when hiring a realtor or a new home salesperson? And why should they choose Anya Chrysanthem as their realtor, new home salesperson of choice? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think it comes down to realizing the fact that you are not buying or building a home every day. That's not something you do as a consumer and you shouldn't be an expert. So it's important that you hire an expert because guess what? It's going to save you a lot of money in a long run. Mm. So it's uh, just like having a financial advisor who is going to be able to give you an objective advice and uh, ultimately prevent you from doing more harm than, than good. Uh, it's the same thing with real estate. You should hire an expert and you should hire an expert specifically in what you're looking to accomplish. So if it's new home sales, then I'm your expert. If it's buying a historical fixer upper, I will find a perfect person for you that I can refer you to. Because guess what? That's not going to be my expertise. <laughs> awesome. Anya, this has been great. Thank you again for taking the time to come on. Um, I know things are crazy right now, probably at your house. So <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, last thing, where can people find and connect with you? So if you're looking to connect on social media, I am at Anya Chrysanthemum on all social media and it's A-N-Y-A-C-H-R-I-S-A-N-T-H-O-N. If you're a real estate professional and looking to see what I am doing with my trainings, et cetera, then check out anyakersanton.com. And if you're looking to buy a house or you're looking for an agent um, or you, you, know, you want to uh, see who I can refer you to, if I'm not the right person for you, then it's anya.levelinguprealestate.com. Awesome. Anya. Thank you again. This was great. A lot of great information. Thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate it. it was Thank you. This was fun. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate you having me on the show. And, uh, you know, all the listeners, we'll get through this together. Yes, definitely. It's, it's grass is always greener on the other side. So yes. anyway, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank for you. I'll talk on. to you soon. Yeah. Bye. Thanks guys for listening. I'll see you guys on the next one.